Carpenters Ministry presents this refreshing and life-changing teaching. We trust that this message will be a blessing to you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Lift your hands to him and give him praise. Thank you, Father. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name. We make our boast in you. We make our boast in you. Father, we thank you. Lift your hands. Say something to the Lord. Bless his holy name. He's worthy. Thank you, Father. We bless your name. We give you glory, honor, adoration, both now and forever. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Jesus is Lord. Jesus. Thank you, Father, because you are big and you're big in us. You are big and you're big in us. And that's why we make our boast in you. That's why we make our boast in you. Thank you, Father. Because you're big in us, there is no fear here. There is no fear here. We give you praise, Father. We bless your name. We give you glory. In Jesus' matchless name. Amen and amen. Amen. Good evening, church. Good evening. Why not welcome the person by your side? Give them a handshake. Give them a smile. Tell them you're welcome to church. I'm glad to see you today. Amen. Praise the Lord. Are we ready for the word? Today is also communion service, so we have a great time today. So let's get right into the word. Turn with me again to 1 Kings chapter 4, 21 to 26. We're finishing up the message we started before the soft games and we picked up last week, entitled More Than Enough in the King's House. More Than Enough in the King's House. This is a message that Pastor Ketch preached, I believe, in 2004, but it's a timely word for us at this season. 1 Kings 4, verse 21. So Solomon reigned over all the kingdoms from the river to the land of the Philistines as far as the border of Egypt. They brought tribute and served Solomon all the days of his life. Now Solomon's provision for one day was 30 cores of fine flour, 60 cores of meal, 10 fatted oxen, 20 oxen from the pastures, and 100 sheep besides deer, gazels, roebucks, and the fatted fowl. For he had dominion over all the region on this side of the river from Tipsa even to Gaza, namely over all the kings on this side of the river, and he had peace on every side all around him. And Judah and Israel dwelt safely, each man under his vine and his fig tree, from Dan as far as Beersheba, all the days of Solomon. So Solomon had 40,000 stalls of horses for his chariots and 12,000 horsemen. So we've been looking at this text, considering this text before us, and we saw that Solomon had more than enough on his table. And we started looking at the things that Solomon did that made it possible for him to have this provision and to feed so many people because the, the, the desire of the King of Kings and the Lords of Lords, the Lord Jesus Christ, has not changed. It is still his desire, a greater than Solomon is here in the person of Jesus Christ, and it is his desire to feed men not only physical food, but more importantly, spiritual food, the bread of heaven, the word of God. And so what made it possible for Solomon to achieve this we said that Solomon appointed people who provided for the kingdom, number one. Secondly, he appointed people who recognized it was their duty, say duty, to provide. And thirdly, he appointed people who recognized it was their season, say season, season to provide. So those are the things that made it possible for there to be more than enough on the king's table, in the king's house. And these are the things also which, if imbibed and applied in our own lives, there will be more than enough 
in this king's house. Can I have an amen? This king of kings and lord of lords, the Lord Jesus Christ, has a big house called the body of Christ. And there are local churches all scattered around that he has raised up. And we are applying this word to this king's house, the local assembly called the Carpenters Church. Now, when we do these three things, there are three other things that are going to happen. And we started by looking one at one of them, or we started looking at one of them last week, which is point number four. We said that the land experiences peace. And what is peace? Peace does not just refer to the absence of war. Actually, in our context of this study, peace refers to nothing missing or nothing lacking. So when all the governors, can I hear uh, the governors in the house? Amen. So when all the governors do what they should do in providing for the king's house, there will be peace. That means nothing will be missing and nothing will be lacking. So we said that the land experiences a peace where nothing is lacking. And we use, the, we use this to bring out the fact that we said that we can budget something in our financial year. The church can plan for something. But if there are no people to bring those resources, there could be an item that God inspired. There could be things God have, has inspired, excuse me, to be done in a particular phase and season. But that thing may not be realized if people do not do their part. But because we are going to do our part, nothing will be missing and nothing will be lacking. Amen. So let me press this point home a bit more, then we'll go to the other points. We're still looking at number four, the land, land experiences a state of peace. Write this down. God will use people to bring provision from the positional realm to the experiential realm. God will use people to bring provision from the positional realm to the experiential realm. Or we could say God will use people to bring provision from the spirit realm to the physical realm, to the tangible realm. Look with me at 1 Corinthians 2 verse 9. But as it is written, I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. I want you to say God has prepared. The things God has prepared. Good. So God has prepared some things for us. God has prepared some things for your life. God has prepared some things for us as a local assembly. Now, let me ask you, did this verse say the things that God will prepare? Is that what it says? It says the things that God has. You see, everything concerning your life has already been prepared. Everything. You see, when you have this revelation, it puts you in a place of rest where you can receive what God has already made available for you. Ephesians 1.3 says, Blessed be God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings. But where are they? In heavenly places. Or we could say, in a spiritual realm. 2 Peter 1.3 dovetails with that. It says, His divine power has made available, His divine power has given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. So everything about your life, God is not going to prepare it. I know there are some things God is still working on. Don't misunderstand me. But God starts because he has finished. Did you get that? God starts because he has finished. Before you drew your first breath, God knew everything about you. And even the psalmist says, your days have been numbered by God. So God has planned things for you. God has planned things for this local assembly. Let me ask you, when did God plan or prepare and finish the things concerning the Carpenters Church? Sorry? Before the foundation of the world, was it when he called a man, called Pastor Charles Omofoma, Charles Ehidiame Omofoma, and told him to leave the north and come to a city where he had never stayed in. Is that when God knew everything about the Carpenters Church? Is that when God finished and prepared everything about us? No. So when God prepared everything about this ministry, about this local assembly, and all the, the multifaceted arms, are we safe to say that all the money that we need, God has provided it? Are we safe to say so? 
So are we safe to say that are the resources to fulfill every dream and vision in the heart of God for this ministry is already available? It is. But notice, even though it is available, I want you to notice that God uses people to bring it and God reveals it in phases and in stages. In phases and in stages. Let me give you an example. Let's say you take your family out to a restaurant where there is a buffet. To all intents and purposes, the food is prepared. Can I have a, 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 a yes on that? It's prepared. The whole thing is laid out. And I know some people, when they go for buffets, before they start dishing, you know, if you are shy, don't go to some buffets because you think people are looking at you. Nobody is looking at you. That, you'll find that out. I know some people, before they start serving, you know what they do? They first case the joint. First stroll around. Look at it. And they release their master plan. They begin to attack. And you know what they do? They, they, they don't go and eat for, they, those kind of places don't go for one hour. Spend at least two hours. Two and a half. They will take bread roll, they will take pepper soup. And when they sit down, <laughs> you, know, you, you know what I'm saying. How many of you have done that before? <laughs> I don't do that. No, 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 no. I'm too decent, prim and proper. No, seriously, I don't do that. If you believe that, God, God help you. <laughs> so they are just the buckle and they move into action. Course one, they stand up. Have you seen people who have taken rice and later they go and take swallow? Yes. Who is saying yes? Sister Amy, you are one of them. <laughs> What's my point? The food is prepared. But if you are going to enjoy the meal, what do you do? You pace yourself because you can't handle everything at one time. If not, you constipate. That's what God does too. That is why when God called Pastor Charles, he didn't, yeah, the vision of the auditorium was there, but that was not what Pastor Charles was speaking to the congregation from the first day. Are you following me? There are times, there are phases, there are stages in the work, in God's work with you, and God has prepared some things for this church and at different times, God will release them. And we are now the people that will bring that provision from the spirit realm, from the supernatural realm, into this physical, tangible realm. Can I have an amen? So God uses people. Positionally, everything we need, God has made available to us. And you are the instrument that God is going to use, or you are the tool, the vessel, God is going to use to bring the provision down. Look with me at James chapter 1 verse 17. James 1 and 17. Every good, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. Every good and every perfect gift comes from where, please? Would, that be, would we be right to say that it is prepared? Would we be right to say that it's in the spirit realm? Would we be right to say it is positional? It's there. But the good thing about this verse is that it doesn't stop by saying it is from above. Above is the source, God. But what, does, what also happens to every good and perfect gift? What does it do? It comes down. into. Where does it come from? Above, from that spiritual realm. But where does it come down to? This physical realm. Question, which realm is your physical part in? Above or this, or this earth? This physical earth. So you are the person who is going to do what? Pull it down. Now all the provision we need as a local assembly, let's say for instance this new financial year, is already there in that spirit realm. But the last time I checked, God doesn't rain mommy down from heaven. He doesn't rain money down from heaven. So all that money is there in the spiritual realm. Even, listen now, all that God expects you to give as an individual is not only with you physically. In fact, more so, it is there in that supernatural realm. That is why God can ask you to give what you don't have. 
in terms of physical contact. I gave you two illustrations last week from myself, how I did, and one of them, when I didn't have anything, but the Lord laid upon me, and I was able to receive that money, and I was able to give it. That is the way God expects us. So, you do not, listen church, you do not make a promise, a faith promise. You do not make a commitment to the things of God based on what your physical eyes can see at the moment. The reckoning you should make, that you should have, you should make your reckoning based on what you have available to you in the spirit realm and what your faith can transact and receive. Are you following me? You should reckon not just with what you have in your account. There are people, you know, will have the budget reading service very soon. You know, people will make commitments and all. Some people see 50,000 in their account, and so they only commit 5,000 to the budget. Or people see, only see 500,000 in their account, and they only commit 50,000 to the budget. That is not right. What you are meant to reckon with is what is available to you positionally, A, and B, how much of that in this season you can pull down and disperse and distribute to the work of God? Can I have an amen? That is the, re that is the way we are going to pull down resources from the spirit realm into the tangible realm. That is, why thing that is how the provision of God will not only be positional for us, but it will also become experiential. Everything God has given to you is first and foremost and will always remain intact in the positional realm. Always. That is why you can be a Christian and die broke, even though you are rich. Concerning one of the churches in the church age, uh, seven churches of Asia Minor, uh, Jesus spoke to them, encouraged them. He said, I know your poverty, but you are what? Rich. You are rich in Christ, fully provisioned for. But if you don't know how to transact with God and bring things from the spiritual realm into the physical realm, there will be no provision. And that tells me something, that the church actually is depending upon you. Should I say that again? The church is depending upon you. Who is the church? Is this tent the church? Is that auditorium the church? No, it's just a building for us for our corporate worship and edification. The church is you. The church is you. So God is expecting you to bring it down, not so that there will be nothing lacking and nothing missing in Jesus' name. Can I have an amen? So we cannot only plan, but we can exceed what we have set out to achieve. And that is possible because of you, or it is possible through you. Amen. So that's number four. Again, the land experiences what? Peace. And what is peace? Where nothing is lacking. Now let's go to number five. Number five. The people who are providing are also living in more than enough. The people who are providing are also living in more than enough. We are now looking at the effects of when these three things are put into operation. Number one, there is peace, nothing is lacking. Number two or number five, the people who are also, who are providing are also living in more than enough. Listen, won't it be absurd if the people are providing but they are barely getting along? Would there be any inspiration or any encouragement for them to provide? No. You know, you do not, prime, you do not only give to get. But when you give, you get to get. You, you, you cannot miss that, forget that grammar. When you give, that's a good quote actually. You get to get. Your primary overarching reason, overarching reason for giving shouldn't be to get. If not, you turn giving and receiving into kalo kalo. Is that what it's called? Dice. Lord, you turn giving and receiving into a vending machine. Lord, I gave you 50 naira. They say you, you multiply by 100. God, this is a good deal. A hundredfold return. 50 times 100. What's 50 times 100? 5,000. 5,000 to Tashere. God, I give you 500. 
Who is the person on 500? Who is the picture? I don't even know. Who is the person on 500 Naira notes? Uh, nobody here knows. Okay. So, Azikwe, who said that? Okay. I said, Lord, I'll give you one zik. Give me, uh, give me uh, 100 ziks. 50,000. That's not giving and receiving. And 100 fold return is not technically times 100. Not technically. So your reason for giving is to be a blessing. The acid test I use to test my motives is God. If, you, if God never told you, promised you a harvest, would you give? And just answer that to yourself. But the way God set it up is that when you give, you get to get. Are you following me? So that's why it's, the point is the people who are providing, what's happening to them? They are also living in abundance. Look at 1 Kings 4 verse 20. So Judah and Israel were as numerous as the sand by the sea in multitude, eating and drinking and rejoicing. Why were they rejoicing? Because they were eating and what? You know, talk to me, 1 Kings 4.20. They were eating and drinking and rejoicing. Why were they rejoicing? Because they were eating and drinking. Glory to God. There is nothing wrong in rejoicing. So far as you are not rejoicing on a bottle of Gouda or Shayo, you are rejoicing in the Lord. The book of Joel says you shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and you shall bless the name of the Lord who has dealt wondrously with you and my people will not be put to shame. That's God's desire. The people are providing, eating, and merry, you know, having merry meant to make. Look at 1 Kings 4.20, the same verse in the New Living Translation. The people of Judah and Israel were as numerous as the sand on the seashore. They were very contented with plenty to eat and drink. If you want that to be your portion, say amen. amen. And plenty to eat and drink doesn't just refer to food because some people don't eat a lot. All right? So plenty to eat and drink means having more than enough for everything you want to do. Look at it in the message. Judah and Israel were densely populated like sand on an ocean beach. All their needs were met. They ate and drank, drank and were happy. So we see that the people who were eating, sorry, the people who were providing, how do we see them living? They were living in more than enough. Say more than enough. Say more than enough. Is God's desire. Say it. Is God's desire for me. The Bible says in the book of Job 36 verse 11, I believe, it says, if they obey and serve him, they will spend their years in, uh, 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 their days in prosperity and their years in pleasures. Uh -uh. Who said God doesn't want you to have a good life? Amen, church. Who said God says, you are cursed to live in a bachelor all the rest of your life. Or you should live in a bachelor for the rest of your life. No misunderstand me. Maybe I should rephrase that. If you are living in a bachelor, it doesn't mean you are cursed. Sorry. Let me retrieve that. It doesn't mean you are cursed. But listen, why should your Genesis chapter 1 and your, the book of your, well, which book is it? Hebrews, be bachelor. No. No. There is nothing wrong in starting there. If you see me today driving that black beast they just gave me, you will not believe where I'm coming from. But there was a time, I've been in this church since 97, but there was a time that I used to camel to church. You know what camel means? Some of you don't know what camel means. I used to slap to church. Go so whoa. No money. I could have asked my dad, but you know you get to a certain age. I won't say the age. But go so whoa. So what will I do? I will apply wisdom. I will break the transport. Slap this one. That's why any young person who tells me they can't come to church because of, because of transport. You are not serious. If it is the Jesus that is doing me, that is doing you. I, I ask sometimes, is it the same Jesus where they do me so they do you? You will apply wisdom. You say, which one can I camel and comb, slap and trek? I will walk this one. The other one, when you are coming from church, so you apply wisdom with some brothers and sisters. So let me just join you, <laughs> you know. Be a good brother and sister too. They drop you somewhere, you work out the rest, you enter keke, you apply wisdom, you organize your life and you serve Jesus Christ. But it will not be so forever. 
It will not be so forever. It will not. It cannot. Because if you obey and serve him, uh -uh, you will spend your days in prosperity, your years in pleasure. Glory to God. It may not, you may not be a conservative person like some of us. You don't like the bling bling. You just choose not that. Not that you cannot afford it. Amen. Amen. This mindset of managing, let me just manage my life, is a very selfish thing. Amen. Because ultimately God wants to prosper you beyond your mi mind's wildest dreams so that you can be a blessing unto others. Amen. You can be a city set on a hill and people can see you and see how far you have come from where you are and how far God is taking you. And they'll be inspired for their own miracles because of you. Glory to God. Now, look at first, uh, Proverbs eleven twenty four. I want you to notice this thought. That giving out of finances is not a reduction process. It's not a reduction process. The reason why people see 500,000 in their account and they can't be moved to give 200 or 250 or even give everything if God so leads them or they so choose is because for many of us, we see it as a reduction process because the way we have been schooled, tutored, and doctored is that when you take something out of something, what is left is what? Is less than what you gave. But when you come into the kingdom of God, one of the first things you need to do is to renew your mind, to begin to adjust your thinking to God's wavelength and God's ways of doing things. Did I give you Proverbs 11, verse 24? Look at this verse. There is one who scatters, what's the next word there? Yet increases more. That's lovely. And there is one who withholds more than is right, but it leads to poverty. Now, when the word yet is used, what does it connote? What's the implication? He didn't go to school, yet he, speak, he speaks Queen's or King's English. He didn't go to school, but, no, let me not use money counting, because people will not go to school. They feel count money past those who go self. So, uh, uh, let me use one pastor used in this message. She's not so beautiful, but her husband loves her so much. Yet, her husband. Why do they say that? Because you feel that if she's not Miss Universe, what happens? The husband should, ah, and you know men are moved by, I mean, men are more optical than women. That's just the way it is. Uh -huh. Yet, the husband loves her so much. So, in other words, when you use yet, what you're saying somehow on the surface contradicts the, form, the, the first part of the statement. There is one who scatters. Look at that. Scatters. Gives. Yet, not only does he increase, the Bible tells us, he increases more. In other words, contrary to natural expectation, contrary to the natural laws, he increases. Then there is one who withholds. No. There is one who withholds more than is right. So you should withhold. This should be a guide to how you spend your money. When money comes into your hands, you tithe it, you sow it. What are three things we should do with money? We should sow, we should save, we should spend. Three S's. Sow, and I believe it's in that order. Save and do what? Spend. Don't spend what you should save. Don't spend what you should sow. Are you following me? So there is, there, it is right to withhold. Because you can come home one day and your son just tells you something happened. You now, that's not the time you start scabashing, Lord, where is the money? Or call, calling somebody, please borrow me, borrow me 2,000 naira. Borrow me 10,000. You should plan your life. Plan your finances. But what he's saying there is, there is he that withholds more than is necessary and he thinks he will increase by withholding more than is necessary. But what does it tend to? Poverty. Because the forces of corruption. Jesus said, do not lay up treasure for yourself where? On earth. Where moth 
uh, rust, uh, 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 corrupt, and where br thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasure where? In heaven. So what this verse is showing us is this, that giving of finances is not a reduction process. Many of us as Christians need to acclimatize ourselves with God's arithmetic. Did you get that? With God's arithmetic. I quoted last week, the Lord does not see as man sees. When you look at money, the same way you do not, God does not, if two people give money now, somebody gives 50,000, another person gives 5,000, who has given more? Who gave more? Well, we should redefine that. Who says the person who gave 50,000 gave more? Let me ask you. The guy who gave 5,000 only has 20,000. The guy who gave 50,000, is it 50,000 I said, has 5 million. Who gave more? Question. The purchasing power, so we said, why did the person who gave 5,000 gave more? Proportion. Proportionate to what he had. My question. The purchasing power of 50,000 and 5,000, are they the same? Who, who can do, what can, can we do more with 50 than 5? So it is very likely that looking naturally, we are, we are going to say the person who gave 50,000 gave more. But you see, God sees it differently. When the people are giving offerings into the treasuries, here comes a widow, these rich people rather, who came first, and they gave a lot, they gave a lot, they gave a lot. And a woman came and threw in two, two mites. And Jesus, by the word of knowledge, knew that the woman gave all she had. And Jesus used, who did Jesus use as an example? Those people who gave plenty. No, he said this woman has given more than them, than they. Because she gave all that she had. She gave her livelihood. She gave out of her poverty. But they had so much more left. Now, that does not mean it is wrong that if you have five million, you should only give five thousand. That, that God expects you always to give out all the money. That's the letter of it. The principle is generosity and sacrifice. That is what God considers. So God, the way God looks at an offering, the amount given, is not the way we look at it naturally. Somebody working in a multinational can write a check of 300,000 for the work of God or to bless his pastor or something. And a student can give 5,000 naira. But in the sight of God, that student who gave 5,000 naira has given what? Has given more. That is one area where God's arithmetic is different. Here is another area where God's arithmetic is different. Because the Lord does not see as man sees. Again, that verse says, there is one who scatters, yet what happens? He increases. He has 50,000. He gives 20,000. And he increases. He increases. I've said this before. You know, as you walk with God, as a child of God, people should be able to look at your life and the math does not add up. The math does, does not add up. How do I mean? He's a teacher, but he has two plots of land for his own house. Or he, he bought two plots of land. Say, how can that happen? In the Buhari of Nigeria, or the Nigeria of Buhari. But if somebody practices the principles of God, it can happen. I'm not getting many amens today. Don't do me like last week, even though I came with my own amens. Or he's a, he's a, he's a, uh, what's another profession people look down at? She's just a petty trader. But she has put all her children through university single-handedly. So, uh -uh. And she didn't do any wayo. She didn't do any 419. Can it happen? Yes, by applying the principles of the word of God. Can I have an amen? And that's what God wants us to have in our lives. So you need to renew your mind to God's way of thinking to see that giving is not a reduction process. Write 1 Corinthians 2.14 down. Just write that. You don't need to turn there. So as we allow the word of God to renew our minds, we'll see that giving is not a reduction process. The carnal man or the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God for their foolishness to him. Neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. It is the person who does not know God that should 
that when you talk about giving and receiving too, that it should look absurd too. But you as a child of God, the things of God are not meant to be foolishness unto you. Can I have an amen? And you should be able to freely operate in the things of the spirit. Now write this down. Eating, drinking, and rejoicing are for those who are providing. Eating, drinking, and rejoicing are for those who are providing. Look at our text, 1 Kings 4, verse 25 now. And Judah and Israel dwelt safe, safely, each man under his, fig, his vine and his fig tree from Dan as far as Beersheba all the days of Solomon. When the Bible says Dan and Beersheba, it just speaks about the whole expanse of Judah and Israel. Notice it says each man had his own vine and his own fig tree. That means, what, does that, what picture does that give you of? It says, each man under his vine and his fig tree. What, what, what does that tell you? What, does that, what picture comes to your mind when you read that? Sorry? Leisure. What do you say? Leisure, good. Relaxation, good. Each man under his own vine and his fig tree. Luxury, good. We are coming close. So, so I heard something there. Pro, huh? Property. Property. Each man had his own property. You just missed a place to say amen. amen. Okay, you will have your own property. Amen. I see you. <laughs> but you will. Each man, look at it. This is not, I didn't write this. Each man under his own fig tree, his vine, and his fig tree. Look at what the New Living Translation says. During the lifetime of Solomon, all of Judah lived in peace and safety. And from Dan in the north to Beersheba in the south, each family had its own home and garden. Each family had its own home, home and garden. I prophesy this over you. This will be your experience in Jesus' name. And even in this season of the new day, you will come in contact with some of these things. There is a way in God to buy without money. There is a way in God. You don't have to slave. You don't have to labor and labor and labor for 60 years, for 70 years of your life, and you barely have a property. It's not good. That is not God's desire for anybody. If they obey and serve him, I go back to it. They will spend their days in prosperity and their years in pleasure, like one, some of you said, luxury, leisure, pleasure, that is what God wants you to have. God wants you to have your own mini pleasure park. Your own mini, not uh, who is our governor, not here some weekend's pleasure park, uh, you know. Have your own. Oh, Lord, begin to dream of a good house. Desire it. You ma test God. Except the way my salary is, the way your salary is, you will not even buy land. You will not. If how much is a plot? Do we have any barrister? But how much is a plot? In uh Rumu Kini or uh, okay, there is actually a Rumu Kini, but not Rumu Kini. Uh no answer barrister, you know now. How much is a plot? Depend, you two, you know. Which area? Somebody should answer me now. How much is a plot? Okay, this is our area. Oh, man. They said 50 million. No. I still hold myself, Sha. <laughs> 15. Okay, cool, you tempt us more. <laughs> we, are, we, are, we, are, we are working this thing together. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. So, so th 15 million. 15 million, Pali. Even if you buy the one on the outskirts, how much is it? Five. Five. Okay. So you two, how much is your salary? How many years will it take you to save and gather and gather and gather because you want to buy one of Upolu plot of land? Friends, listen. It's either this word works or we are all dummies and have believed a lie. If this word works, God has provided a way of escape for us. 
And listen, Buhari has no plans for you. I come from a generation that have not seen anything good. Most of what I've seen in Nigeria is not enticing. That's one of the arguments I have with my dad because people of their generation enjoyed the good of the nation. As far when I came back from England, the best time I enjoyed power was when I stayed in Kanji for 10 years. We had constant power. As I came into the city, listen, rural area and city, which one supposed to get light fast? City life. She? City life. Igbadun life. Now darkness, so. Yes. And when we came, we moved to Nepal quarters, and there was no power, and we could not buy generator because mommy is a Nepal staff. Was a Nepal staff. We cannot buy, so we'll be in darkness. No light. Is that the country you want to, is that, the, is that what the experience you want your children to have? Listen, either God has a way of escape for us, or we, have, we are, of most men, most miserable. And I make bold to say to you that God has a way of escape for us. The Bible tells us that with his exceeding great and precious promises, we become partakers of the divine nature and escape the corruption, the decay, the corruption, the stealing, the jaku-jaku, the things that are meant to limit you in this world. By the, we escape it through the power of the promises of God. Don't lay hold on Buhari's promises. Don't lay hold on Trump. Don't plan to run to the United States. Lay hold on the word of God. And the word of God will produce for you. Stay on the word. Work the word till that word produces in your life. Because it is bound to produce in your life. Glory to God. Otherwise, some of you will not send your children to university. Because the way it is. And government universities, so, we are, some are still good. But the trend is changing. You have to believe God and lay hold on his way of escape. Glory to God. You know, people often say things like, uh, you know, in Nigeria, the middle class has been eroded, has been erased. And some who probably, or some of us, or some who feel they were born into middle classes, you know, we come from a middle class, you know, middle. You are, you are glad you are in the middle. That means you are not in the top. Middle. Uh, we, do you know, have you seen how stratified society is? How fragmented and segmented? These are the rich. These are the poor. These are the in-between. Listen, the rich of yesterday, in today's world, they don't be rich, yo. True talk. But I've got news for you. How about the God class? I don't... You see, I don't like all these terms. You, you are from this. You are from that. You, you are middle class. Don't come near me with that. I may give you a hand of fellowship. I may extend a, a good hand, a wiper to you. No, I will not do that. I'm a gentleman. But my point is, I belong to the God class. Not middle class, con -con. not uh, 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 any human standard or stratification. I belong to the God class. I belong to the giver's class. You may look at me and say, I don't even fit into mid middle class. Be my guest. Big deal. I belong to the God's class. And I belong to the giver's class. Glory to God. So we see here a picture of a garden. Look at this. Gives a picture of a really nice house set back on a number of plots of land. Yes. You can have your own garden. Begin to, how will it happen? Start by desiring it. Start by desiring, Lord, this is what I want. This is the kind of house I want. And you begin to pray, speak towards it, sow towards it, declare towards it, declare towards it. Father, I receive this two plots. If, that's what you're, if your faith can handle one plot or even one quarter plot. No, no, one quarter is not good. <laughs> Do they sell half plot? Some buy half. Okay, if your faith can handle half plot. Okay, Father, I receive half plot, half plot, half plot. Half plot. And there is little space for you to just park your car. That kind that as they open the gate, your, your, the behind of your car is close to the gate. And people have to be entering like this. If you start like that to escape landlord scourge, it is okay. There is no condemnation. That's where you are. Can I have an amen? amen. But when you get there, don't say, ha, thank you, Lord. I've been delivered eternally. You have not been delivered, though. 
Say there is more. There is more. There is more. There is more. For you in God. And this will be your portion and your experience when you are a manager, when you are a provider for the king's house. Can I have an amen? amen. Glory to God. Point number six, let's end with this. The king has lasting impact far and wide. Glory to God. Amen. Number one, we said today, <clears throat> the people who are, that's point number five, the people who are providing are also living in more than enough. And finally, number six, or the third point for today, the king, and who is the king here? King Jesus has lasting impact far and wide. First Kings 4.30. Thus Solomon's wisdom excelled the wisdom of all the men of the east and all the wisdom of Egypt. In the message, it says, So Solomon's wisdom outclassed the vaunted wisdom of wise men of the east outshone the famous wisdom of Egypt. Notice that. It excelled, it outclassed, it outshone. Amen. So Solomon's wisdom was heard far and wide. Say after me. Solomon's wisdom was heard far and wide. Who is a greater than Solomon? Jesus Christ. Now, Solomon's wisdom, people heard of it, and what does God want to be heard in this day and age? The wisdom of his son, Jesus Christ, who himself is made unto us, what? Wisdom from God. In fact, the Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, Paul said that, And I, brethren, when I came to you, did not come uh, in the excellency of wisdom, declaring unto you the uh, testimony of God, for I determined to know nothing ab among you except Jesus Christ and him who's crucified. And I was with you in weakness and fear and trembling, and my speech and my preaching were not in enticing words of men's wisdom, men's wisdom, but in demonstration of uh, the spirit and power, that your faith may not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. How be it we speak wisdom among those who are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor the rulers of this world that come to nothing, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God had foreordained from the foundation of the world to our glory. So you see a comparison between the wisdom of the world, the wisdom of men, and the wisdom of God. And how is the wisdom of God conveyed? Through preaching. Because Paul said, I came doing what? Preaching unto you. So the same way Solomon's wisdom outshone the wisdom of the men of the east. I want you to know that the men of the east were the philosophers of those days. They were the astrologers. They were the doctors, the medical scientists, the philosophers, the architects. The wisdom of that day was compounded in the wisdom of the east. In fact, the Magoi, the wise men that came to see Jesus, where did they come from? The east. But Solomon's wisdom outshone them. So we could say that Solomon's wisdom outclassed the wisdom of his age. In the same way, the wisdom of God, Jesus Christ, is greater than the wisdom of this world. And that wisdom has been delivered unto us. And we declare that wisdom through what? Preaching. Through the ministry of the word of God. Now, what this is showing us is that the king, Jesus, can have impact far and wide where his wisdom is made available. But for that wisdom to be made available, guess what? People must make the resources available for that wisdom to be carried far and wide. Can I have an amen? Look at Ecclesiastes 9 and 16. Ecclesiastes 9, verse 16. Then I said, wisdom is better than strength. Nevertheless, the poor man's wisdom is despised, and his words are not heard. Now look at 1 Kings 4, that same chapter, but now look at verse 34. Look at what he says concerning Solomon. And the men of all nations, say all nations, all nations, what happened from the kings of the earth, from all the kings of the earth, who heard of his wisdom, came to hear the wisdom of Solomon. All nations, say all nations. What did Jesus say? Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all nations, to every creature. You see there, this is a type of that. Solomon was a type of Jesus and this is the type, this is the wisdom of God 
delivered unto us. But notice in verse 16, do you see a problem, Ecclesiastes 9, 16, with the, 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 we, the, the, the poor man who is wise? Do you see a mis- Is there something wrong with that? For somebody to be wise and his wisdom delivered a city, if you study it, but the Bible says he was poor. Do you think poor and wisdom, poor and wise are incongruous? Are they incongruous? <laughs> wise and poor, are they, do they go together? Wisdom and poverty, are they neighbors? Are they, are, are they twins? Are they brothers? Are they from the same mother? Who gives wisdom? The Lord gives wisdom and out of his mouth comes knowledge and understanding. If you read Proverbs chapter 3, you see this is a, a misnomer. Because the Bible says that in wisdom's left and right hands, one of the things inclu- included are, will, are riches, wealth, and honor. So that means if I follow the wisdom of God, what will it lead me to? A place of resources. In fact, Proverbs 3 says, or Proverbs 4, exalt her and she shall promote you. A crown of glory shall she place on your head, on your head when you doth embrace her. So wisdom and, and, uh, and poverty do not go together. But you see, it says here that the poor man's wisdom was despised and his words were not heard. Do you know why? Because the poor man, even though he's wise, he has this poor man, hasn't learned to translate the wisdom he has into something material and tangible. Do you know that there are people who have come into intellectual property discoveries, i.e. patents, copyrights, breakthroughs, and when they got them, because they were so poor, do you know what they did? They sold it or some, 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 uh, Crooked or suave or, 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 or wayo businessman bought it from them. A patent, something that probably would have cost $5 million. Do you know how much they sold it for? $50,000. Do you know why? They were hungry. They were hungry. Did they have wisdom to bring about that invention? Yes. But what was their problem? They could not translate it. But look at what happened to Solomon. Not only did Solomon have wisdom, look at the Bible says, look at verse 34, 1 Kings 4, and the men of all nations from the kings of the earth who heard of his wisdom came to hear the wisdom of Solomon. Can you see what I'm saying? The Bible says they heard of his wisdom, and when they heard of his wisdom, what did they do? They came to hear the wisdom of Solomon. What does that mean? That simply means that you are in Lagos. You hear of the carpenter's church. You leave Lagos and you come to hear the wisdom of God. Amen, church. Is that impact, church? Is that impact? That's what happened with the queen of Sheba. The queen of Sheba had heard of Solomon. And when she heard, what did she say? I'm going to look for this man. And she got there. And when she got there, she said, was it half? Half of what, of a truth I have heard of you in my land. But half of what you, I was told, is, is nothing compared to what I have seen. She heard of the wisdom of Solomon in Sheba, and she came to hear Solomon speak that wisdom. Listen, church, you are not just in any church. You are in the carpenter's church. And there is a great destiny and mandate upon this ministry. And in this season of the new day, God is intent to make forth the wisdom he has put in here, the word, the preaching of the gospel that he has committed to us. His intent to make him spread abroad to as far as, he, as far as he has planned in these last days in the name of Jesus. And you and I are the people that will make that happen. Can I have a good amen? So the wisdom of Solomon... His wisdom was heard, and people came to receive of it. In conclusion, look with me at Second Samuel. Sorry, Second Timothy three and four. Second Timothy three to four. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Second Timothy three four. You therefore must endure hardship 
as a good soldier of Christ. No one engaged in warfare entangles himself with, himself with the affairs of life that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. I want you to write this down. Soldier engaged in warfare and soldier in verses 3 and 4 respectively are the same word, the same Greek word. And what's that word affairs? The word affairs in verse 4 is the Greek word pragma, which means, just write this down, negotiation or transaction. Note that down. Negotiation or transaction. And life refers to livelihood. It's the Greek word bios, B-I-O-S, from where we get the word biology and bio. For instance, it's bio, your biography, your bio, just something about your life. So the word life there means livelihood. What is Paul saying? Who is Paul writing to here in 2 Timothy? Who is he speaking to? Talk to me now. Who is he speaking to? Timothy. Who is Timothy? He's a pastor, right? Pastor of the church of Ephesus. All of us read the pastoral epistles and we can all be blessed by it. But the pastoral epistles are actually, which is 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus, are actually written primarily to pastors, people like us. Who is the soldier there? It can apply to every Christian. But in context, he's referring to who? The pastor. And he's saying, you as a good soldier of Christ, what must you do? Endure. You must endure hardship. And then in verse 2, it says, no one engaged in warfare. That is a soldier. No one engaged in warfare does what? Entangles himself with the affairs of life. That word affairs, did I give you what it means? It means the word what? transaction or negotiation. Did I give you that? It means negotiation or transaction. What are you seeing here? Who is the soldier? The pastor. The pastor actually should not get himself involved in some things. Why? Because if he does, he will be distracted. Do you know that in the Bible times when this was written, a soldier got his salary. No matter what happened in the economy, the soldier always got his wages. In the United Kingdom, judges, and I believe soldiers, are paid from what is called the consolidated fund. How many of you have heard that before? What's a consolidated fund? It's a fund such that no matter what happens to the economy, the judge, are you sure, is, should the judge be paid? No, talk, should the judge be paid? Paris is laughing. Should the judge be paid? Yeah. Yes, because if you don't pay the judge, uh -huh, he, you will tempt, in fact, at a point, you will not be tempted anyway. He will ask you, oh boy, see my, I, when I was practicing law, I knew there were some judges that were, okay, <laughs> that were collectors, <laughs> and, and they used their, some of their court people as their instrument. What's the point? If he's not paid, what will happen to him? You'll open him up to temptation. That's what Paul is saying, that nobody called to the ministry should be engaged in certain affairs of life because you'll be distracted. I'm sure if you ask the assistant pastors here, if they have enough time to focus on their calling, they will ask God, if you can give me 10 more extra hours, I will like it. Am I correct? Because you are fully involved. I practiced law for, some, for a while, and the law firm I practiced, we were very busy. But when I left practice and I came into ministry, I'm doing more in ministry than I'm doing in practice. Brodan often talks about some, one place where he worked and that where, where there are pastors in a particular denomination. And when it's about for that time for them to go to church, when it's like maybe 4 o'clock, I won't call the denomination, they open their Bible and start copying, start preparing a note on the go. Note, message on the go. And when they come to church, that is what they deliver. Is that the kind of message you want to get? Don't you want your pastors to have time to devote on the word? to stay in the spirit so that when they come, they deliver the heart of God for you. But do you know why some pastors keep two jobs and three jobs? Because they are distracted. They are involved in the entanglement of life and they cannot give the counsel of God as he wants it. Are you following me, church? When you do what God expects you to do, this will not be our experience. This will not be, and some, I mean, we are full-time here, but you also know that there are some distractions that pastors face because the members are not just doing what they are meant to do. But in this new day, in this season, everybody is rising up to their place in the name of Jesus. Because you are all governors and you recognize who God has called you. 
And God has called you a mighty man. And as pastor has often declared that one of you is more than a thousand. Nay, one of you is more than 10,000. So shall it be in the name of Jesus. The giant on the inside of you is rising up. And it's gaining the mastery in the name of Jesus. And as you follow the spirit of God and take those baby steps of faith, you see the father, you see the Lord Jesus launching you into the deep. You see yourself stepping on water, moving mountains where finances were concerned. God is ushering you into a new level of financial responsibility and financial liberty. Financial responsibility and financial liberty, says God. As you take your responsibilities to heart and follow me, says God, and do what I've called you to do and obey my promptings and silence the voice of the senses and the flesh, then you will know greater financial liberty. You will know greater financial liberty. Your hand will know, law, will know no lack and your hand will touch sums and amounts that you have only dared to dream of. For I am the one who can do greater exceedingly and abundantly above all you ask or think. And I am confirming that in your life in this season, says God. So rise up, don't be intimidated. Obey me and you will spend your days in prosperity and your years in pleasures, says the Spirit of grace to his people. Lift your hands and receive God's word. Thank you, Father. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name. Glory to your name. Oh, thank you, my Father. I give you praise. Thank you for the liberty you've brought us into. Thank you for the responsibility and the liberty. We give you praise. We bless your glorious name. We bless your name. Thank you. There is more than enough in this king's house. There is more than enough in the king's house. And there is more than enough in our own lives. And as your purpose is fulfilled, even our desire, the desires of our own hearts will be fulfilled. We give you praise and glory in Jesus' name.